Well, first of all, thank you all for taking time out of your Sunday afternoon to come and join us for the presentation. Um, this is a wonderful joint program between the Open Historical Society and the Wright Memorial Public Library. Um, we hope that you get a lot of information out of today's presentation from Mark. Um, he's a dynamic and very interesting speaker. I think you're going to learn a lot about the architecture of Oakwood. Um, Mark has gone ahead and, and consented to, as he goes through the slides, if you have a question, stop him and ask the question then, because it'll be a lot easier for him to address something in one of the slides than at the end of the presentation, try and go back and find the house that you're asking the question about. So please consider doing that. Um, just a couple of other quick announcements. Um, and you'll probably see it in Mark's presentation, but on April the 23rd, um, if you've not already gotten your tickets for the Oakwood Historical Society and Dayton Histories Right at Home Tour, um, please consider doing that. It's always a fascinating tour to go through that Hawthorne Hill House and hear from people who know the history of the house speaking. The other thing, and one of our speakers is here today, Bernie Wisner, but on April the 16th, the last of the Spring Far Hill Speaker Series will be held here and we are going to be talking about the gardens of Oakwood. So Georgie was telling me before the presentation, he's found the original map of Mrs. Wright's garden. That was all laid out. So he'll be talking us through that, showing us some slides and talking about several of the other gardens in Oakwood. And then Mira, whose last name I'm gonna forget, is a master gardener and he'll talk the second half of the presentation about what garden trends are now in terms of native plants, what you can do in your own yard and everything else like that. So please put that on your calendar. I think it's going to be a fascinating presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce my friend, who I've known since I became involved in the Open Historical Society, Mark Risley. Mark is not only the president of Emeritus of the Open Historical Society, but he is a lecturer down at the University of Dayton's Ocean Lifelong Learning Center, gives presentations on a variety of topics. I think you're going to really enjoy today. So without further ado, Mark, over to you. I have no further ado. So. <laughs> Pardon the noise here. This makes it amazing. Okay, can everybody hear me all right? All right, thank you all. Um, yeah, we got a great crowd here today, so uh, just be aware of where the exits are. There's double doors, a single door, then there's the one I'm going to make. <laughs> so uh, in case of an emergency. So first of all, welcome everybody. This is uh, the classic architecture of Oakwood. Uh, if you're in the back and you can't see quite up here to something, you want to take a closer look. It's also being shown on that screen at the back of the room. Uh, my thanks to the organizers of the Far Hill Speaker Series, Donna Rosenbaum and uh, of the Oakwood Historical Society and Chris Leininger of uh, Wright Memorial Public Library who have made these programs possible. Also to all of you uh, in attendance, either by Zoom or in the room, I hope you will find today's program interesting and informative. Architecture is a marriage of art and engineering. Today's presentation uh, will focus uh, on more on the artistic aspect of Oakwood Homes. Oakwood has always attracted the type of people with the uh, desire and wherewithal to maintain, preserve, or restore their homes. Uh, that's why there's so many well-preserved examples of uh, early 20th to mid-century uh, architecture in Oakwood. In the early 90s, um, Shantz Park District was nominated to the National Register of Historic Places, and uh, they lauded it as one of the finest nominations they had ever received. Uh, usually, these <clears throat> are being nominated to try and restore an area or bring up a, uh, an area, but uh, uh, in Oakwood, the, the homes were already there. They were already preserved and already in great shape, so it didn't take them long to... Uh, go ahead and uh, and approve that nomination. Um, the, the, the homes here are rich in style and details, and uh, they represent the finest in living uh, from homes designed by professional architects to classic and durable Sears kit homes. 
Also during this presentation, we'll touch on some of the historical aspects of the homes and their residents. Uh, this is an informal presentation again. So if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and raise your hand and I'll try and answer them as I go along. If I don't see your hand up, throw something at me and I'll try to get back. And get it. <laughs> so if you see your home in this presentation, thank you. I uh, took a picture of it because it uh, <laughs> appears to be uh, the best of representing of what I'm trying to get to here. Um, You'll see here we have some uh, prominent architects of early, uh, early Oakwood, and those are them. There are, we do have walking tour booklets that were made possible uh, by the Oakwood Historical Society, and some of them with the help of the Oakwood Rotary Foundation. Um, Sean's Park and Schaefer Heights. And um, I think uh, you'll see that little blue box on some of these slides that says NRHP, and that means that <clears throat> either that area or that uh, building is on a National Register of Historic Places. It also has the date that it was entered. If you're wondering where um, Schaefer Heights is, uh, as you can see here, uh, Oakwood High School is right here. The Oakwood Community Center is here. There is the athletic field and Schaefer Park is down here. So it's just about a, I'm sorry, it's just about a four and a half block area um, that's and all of these are just great for walking, uh, taking a bike tour, or just driving around looking at the homes. And these uh, the um, walking tour booklets could help you out quite a bit to understand and appreciate some of these homes. Our first stop is going to be the Craftsman style. Now, this is the most prevalent style in Oakwood, although English Tudor is the most well known. Uh, revealed construction. Um, whereas the construction values become part of the decoration is part of is is essential in the craftsman um, in the craftsman style. This is a uh, a Whitman sampler, uh, Esther Price sampler of architectural details. Here uh, at the top we have a cliff gable. Um, we also have there's natural stone in the chimney and foundations. The top excuse me, I'm getting used to this pointer. Uh, the top um, uh, wall covering is of uh, board and batten. On this level, it's shingle style. And further below, we have clapboard. Uh, the windows uh, are different forms here. This is what is known as an eight over one. Down below, we'll see a six over one. And that's how that's, uh, uh, classified as far as the windows. Am I getting too far away from the microphone here? Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. I'm just going to move it over a little bit. There we go. Uh, we also have what's known as a bell cast eave. Right here, you'll see how this, the corner of this, uh, uh, this wall comes down and then just kind of flares out a little bit. And that's to, 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 to get, take rain a little bit further away from the foundation by a few few inches. Uh, there's large beams for the porch roof supports, um, roof brackets or, or um, exposed rafter tails underneath the overhangs. Uh, this is this is when you get the second story that comes out a little bit further than the uh, uh, first story. It's called a garrison feature, and underneath here we see what is called corbels, and they're right underneath. They're more decorative than anything. And the Craftsman style was popular from 1900 to 1929 during the American Arts and Crafts era. And uh, that was when Oakwood was being developed. So that's why there's so many Craftsman influenced homes here. Uh, here's another example. This is over on Four Boulevard and we see the exposed rafter tails up here under the, um, under the roofs and we have the large uh, supports here for the porch. Uh, this would be known as kind of a sleeping room in the summertime before air conditioning, you would have these sleeping porches or sleeping uh, rooms where you could actually have a bed in there or pull a mattress out on your sleeping porch and in the era before air conditioning and you would uh, be able to stay a little bit cool out there. 
The reason I like this house is because here it is under construction in 1917. Uh, we see here uh, the gentleman down here, the journeyman craftsmen who were all in there. They got their Bib Levi's on, but they got their white shirts and ties. It was definitely another time, another era. Oftentimes the tools and materials would arrive during this era on, on uh, by horse-drawn wagon. And there were very few trucks at the time, but uh, there, there were some out there, but uh, uh, mostly you weren't in that big of a hurry to get it done, so uh, they bring it up. And this is uh, for Boulevard. I will point out back here, whoops, yeah, wrong one. Bear with me, here we go. Um, back here, this is back, this is this area right behind us here, and it's planted in corn. And uh, so you can see this is uh, right behind uh, uh, Wright Library here. These guys always remind me of Laurel and Hardy trying to move a piano up a staircase. <laughs> Some of you older folks will recognize. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is one way we date something like this. Uh, David Schmidt of the Oakwood Historical Society had uh, done research and he had found this home, uh, an ad for this home from uh, the Dayton Sunday News on Sunday, uh, March 17th of 1918. So, uh, wow, what about 105 years ago this week? And uh, so that's how we can date when something like that was made, uh, a home like that was built. These are craftsman details. Uh, they always say uh, that with these designs there, as opposed to like Queen Anne or Victorian style, these are designs that are uh, simple, but not plain. So you'll get a, a simple artistic detail up here on a porch post, uh, roof brackets. This is part of that revealed construction. Um, it's where the, the, the construction values of the home become part of the decoration. Again, we've got the exposed rafter tails down along here and natural colors and materials from na nature. That was pretty much the hallmark of craftsman style. It was a return to nature. These are a couple of, Sorry. yes. Uh, the photo you had of the construction of that. That is, uh, actually, that is uh, in a panoramic photo of Four Boulevard. Do we have any of those available at the Historical Society? We have like one or two. Yeah, and it's a panoramic photo of Four Boulevard. It was, believe it or not, it was uh, found in a dumpster dive about 15 years ago when a, a student, an Oakwood student, was working up at the uh, city building, and they were clearing out a closet up there. and. Uh, that was on its way to the dumpster when uh, this gentleman found it, and, and uh, his parents eventually gave it to us. And I had we had copies made. We try to make these available. I, uh, I'm sure Tom might be able to duplicate some of those. Maybe I don't know. I don't yeah, want to think. But it was part of one of the spades uh, brochures. No, it wasn't. No, huh? it's an entire, it was found in a dumpster dive and we were fortunate enough to get it before it was um, sacrificed. So <laughs> this is what is known as a high style craftsman, that's Shadow Brook. And uh, down here in the lower right is the home of Walter Schaefer and he was the developer of Schaefer Heights. And uh, high style just means it's over the top, beautiful design. <laughs> really doing it up. So if you're interested in that style, and here are several homes here in Oakwood that are all um, uh, craftsman style. The periodicals are American Bungalow Magazine and Arts and Crafts Homes and The Revival. This is a, a uh, style that is being revived right now, though the hottest style right now being revived is mid-century modern, which we'll talk about a little later on. Also, the National Arts and Crafts Conference is the third weekend in February down at Grove Park Inn in Asheville, North Carolina. It's a great place to visit anyway if you want to just spend a long weekend or you're on your way south. Uh, it's a good place to stop. The 
Uh, hotel was built in 1913. It was a state-of-the-art resort at that time, and it still is. And uh, if you go to the uh, conference, you'll see a lot of the uh, antique dealers and contemporary revival artists, but a lot of the dealers from uh, you'll see on Antiques Roadshow. Our next style is um, uh, the English Tudor Revival. Let me tell you where the term revival comes from. These styles got popular in the early 20th century, and it was because of Hollywood. People would see Douglas Fairbanks and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. swashbuckling through an old English castle or an old English home or a Spanish castle, and people, as, as America was growing and people were making money, they were saying, I'd like to have a house like that. So that's where the term revival got popular in the early 20th century. Yeah. The English Tudor uh, from 1890 to 1940, a lot of them are still being made today. Um, that was their, that, when I give you these dates, that was their heyday, but it wasn't necessarily the only time that they were made because they're still being uh, made. Uh, again, hallmark of Oakwood Architectural is based on 15th and 16th century styles. And um, you'll have primarily the uh, features on this is a front facing uh, gable like this one and a little bit of this one, this dormer up here, and also this steep roof line. You'll also see um, many of them, not all of them, have what's called half timbers. And uh, they are reminiscent of this, uh, their, this revival came back from the British arts and crafts movement, which happened before the American arts and crafts movement. And it too was a return to nature. And those half timbers, as you see them come up and some of them flare out, they're reminiscent of tree trunks and tree branches that spread out and give you a more kind of a natural touch to this. And uh, also their uh, uh, exteriors are often clad in brick and or stucco. Uh, we see here uh, some of the um, more public places here in Oakwood, Oakwood High School, the, our city building, uh, Wright Library here um, was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2014 through the efforts of the Oakwood Historical Society, and Edwin D. Smith Elementary School, also in uh, English Tutor. Here are some of the um, details. Uh, you'll have this... Uh, hand carved uh, woodwork that's on Smith School there, believe it or not. You'll have these very decorative chimney pots and these chimney pots are actually very useful. What they are is they're made usually made of clay. Clay absorbs heat faster than the brick or the cinder block inside the chimney. So as the heat goes up that chimney and makes contact with the chimney pots, the chimney pots heat up and as we know, heat rises. So that um, will uh, further cause a draw into the fireplace and up the chimney so that you're not getting smoke back into the, to the uh, living room there. Uh, we also have the Tudor arch here. It's a, um, on many of the uh, structures, it comes up straight, curves in and comes to a point at the top. You also have leaded glass windows, usually in a diamond pattern and sometimes stained glass patterns. Here's a few more um, examples. Uh, that's the original home of um, <laughs> Barry. And, and um, L. M. Barry was uh, Lauren M. Barry was uh, he didn't invent the yellow pages, but he is responsible for the format that we now use for the yellow pages. I, most people here probably haven't seen yellow pages on a decade or so. But uh, that was Lauren M. Barry's. He's got a garage in the back. He apparently liked Cadillac's story was there's a, about a six or seven car garage in the back and he, he had the money so he liked one for every day. <laughs> That's the story. This is a, another form of, uh, of it. It's a Jacobian tutor and it's more like a castle-like um, with the uh, buttresses. Let's see, here's some buttresses on the wall here. And these battlements you can see along the roof line there. 
And that's reminiscent of the old castles where they had those battlements they could stand beside behind and, and shoot through those uh, arrows and spears and uh, throw boiling oil down on their people trying to. And we st can still do that today with uh, politicians and uh, some of the door-to-door uh, uh, -door salesmen. <laughs> this is what is known as a dramatic tutor. It's the original home of Adam Shantz Jr. And uh, their, their company business was pretty diversified. Mostly they had um, uh, meat processing plants. And they were also uh, had a uh, pretty nice uh, operation going with uh, uh, as a brewery. Uh, this is uh, again Germanic uh, Tudor, and it has the Gothic arches where it comes up and just does a, a gradual curve all the way up to that point there. Uh, if you've ever been in this house, and, and you know, I always try to go to some of these things when they have an open house, but this third floor up here is a uh, a uh, small ballroom up there. So they've got a bar in there now and uh, pool tables. At least I think they do. So uh, the next one here, this is another form of Tudor. It's called the Cotswold Cottage. And it's it's about the um, uh, copied after the inspired by uh, uh, homes in the Cotswold region of uh, of England. And it's it's got a lot of quirky angles, artistic details, and kind of a whimsical fairy tale appearance. Uh, take a look at this dead coming. <laughs> take a look at this uh, this uh, uh, hinge strap here, very artistic on top and bottom. So uh, very, I mean, you can almost see a full moon rising behind uh, that house and uh, it was designed by Alison Smith. <coughs> This is French Normandy. I'm going to take a sip of water here. Excuse me. This is a uh, French Normandy. It's got the turret there, and um, a lot of uh, very similar to the uh, Cotswold Cottage because it has a uh, you know, some quirky features on it. It's very artistic. But take a notice up here. This weather vane is. Uh, Diana the Huntress with her hounds. And um, this was the uh, home, as we all know, of Dr. Gisbert El Bossard. So you're all saying, who the heck was that? <laughs> Excuse me. What street is that on? That's on Harmon Boulevard. Okay, if you go up to the, you go down Schaefer here yeah. to uh, the, the athletic field and there's a street that cuts off in the middle of the athletic field. That's Harmon uh, Boulevard, and, and that house sits about two lots in. Uh, yeah, I thought so. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, Bossard was uh, quite a character. Uh, first thing he got famous for was uh, sneaking into the uh, Mormon temple in Salt Lake City in 1911. <laughs> Excuse me. And taking photographs, which was... Uh, Pretty much forbidden, and he did that in cooperation with Max Florence, who was a big promoter at the time. But what happened was uh, later on, he becomes a uh, an electronic wizard, and he holds patents in the um, flashing railroad sign, uh, the multi chimed uh, doorbells, and also that. Uh, the word crawl, which as we see up here in uh, Times Square. So what did that all involve? Well, it involved the interruption of electrical currents. So it made things blink, uh, change tones, and, uh, and made that word crawl possible as well. He started a company uh, called uh, uh, Telechime. This uh, down here, we'll see a, uh, an example of his uh, one of his brochures from 1936, and that's the doorway uh, of that home uh, as it stands today. Had to reverse the picture because it was in the uh, uh, in the promotional brochure. <clears throat> uh, back then, it was quite 
the thing people followed rich people and they did their travels and went here and went there and did this and did that. So it was big news that he had uh, bought this home in the uh, Hodap uh, Schaefer section. Um, as we see here, this photograph is from 1931. And there's Diana the Huntress with her hounds. He was on the American Economist uh, cover, and uh, he was listed as a uh, uh, world electrical wizard uh, who had worked with uh, uh, Edison and uh, Steinmetz. <coughs> Excuse me. He was the inventor and uh, and quite the electrical whiz. So he had a, the, this home. Uh, I don't think it still has a pool in back, but had a swimming pool in back. And even though you're a uh, a nerd in a lab coat, if you want to get a swimming pool in the money, you can see the babes will come to your house. Uh, this is uh, High Acres, and this uh, goes back, it was the original home of Frederick Reich. Many of the older people here will remember Reich's downtown. The uh, Schuster Center sits there now. And uh, this was also the former Dayton Philharmonic Volunteer Association Designer show, show House and Gardens. I think COVID kind of put an end to that. I, hopefully they'll start that up again sometimes. So they feature a lot of homes and beautiful homes in the Dayton area and uh, the designers go in, and make the rooms look awesome. Uh, High Acres, uh, this was back when estates had names. And uh, these were, sometimes they're referred to as nicknames, but they weren't nicknames, the entire estate, the cars, the land, the house, your bank accounts and everything were had a name uh, for the, um, <clears throat> and oftentimes they were descriptive of the area where the house sat. So this was high acres. It sits on top of the uh, of the hill just before you cross the bridge on Ridgeway Road to uh, go into uh, uh, Kettering there over uh, Dorothy Lane. I want to talk a little bit about architectural integrity. In 2004, uh, the city of Oakwood came up with a comprehensive plan to look forward toward the future and see what uh, kind of uh, what we can ex expect. And one of their points was maintaining and protecting community characters. So you want to maintain the look of the community, the trees, the early 20th century housing, and uh, the homes and parks and everything like that. It's all part of this maintaining and protecting community character. An example of that is the uh, city building. Uh, you can see there, one section built in 1925, an addition in 1960, and around 2004, they um, <clears throat> uh, added this last section, and that maintained the architectural integrity of the, the structure. Here's the Harmon School. This section here was in 1918. These two sections were added in 2004, and you can hardly tell that they're new. Well, we go to Edwin D. Smith Elementary School, which was built in 1926. This is the uh, North Wing, and uh, that's the entrance to it. This is the other end of it, and it's just a mirror image of that, and this dates to 2004. They even uh, duplicated the door handles on the original section. So they must have done a cast on them and, and did that all right. Okay, let's take a little quiz here. <laughs> Who would like to uh, point out the oldest home and what year it was built? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? <laughs> um, Okay, young lady. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, there is one that I've seen, Mark. Yeah. It's uh, what's it on? It's right up here, and it's distinctive because it's the only one on the street facing west. Okay. Mm -hmm. All the others are facing north and south. Okay. I can't think of street. Okay. Skyria. Uh, I, I, it's, I, I, it's, they stay for house on Skyria. Okay, yeah. The original farmhouse. Right. Yeah. Just yeah. on the on yeah. the north side of the high school. 
Well, right right now on uh, on this one, and yeah, that's that's which one it would be. On this one, we're trying to determine which is the oldest house and what year it was built. Well, here's the years that these were built. The oldest house in this cluster of, of homes was built in 1999, and that is what is known as architectural integrity. It maintains the appearance of the, of the community and the neighborhood and everything. Now, the one in the lower right was just built in 2014, but it's based on a 1940 um, uh, house design. And uh, here we are, Wright Memorial Library. Recently, I did a lot of additions here and everything, and I'll let the library talk about that. But uh, I forget when I took that photo. It had to have been over a decade ago or around a decade ago. And I just took this one on Thursday. So as you can see, they've maintained even the interior architectural integrity of uh, the library. So that's a, an important thing here in, in uh, Oakwood. We like our how our community looks. And, and we even when we build new, it looks old. We'll move on to more styles. This is an Italianate revival. Usually they're popular from 1890 to about 1935. Uh, comes with a, a hipped roof, wide overhangs, full length arched windows on the first floor, usually clad in stucco, but can be in stone or brick. And um, we'll take a look at another one here. This is the original home of Levitt Luzerne Custer, you know, in Dayton. Must have been something in the water, but they're. Uh, really um, uh, had a lot of inventors here. And uh, now the ar architect for that home, although it looks very, very similar to the uh, Dayton Art Institute, that the architect on that was uh, Edward Broadhead Green, who was nationally known. We had more of a uh, uh, local architect in Albert Pretzinger, and he designed this home up here. Now, who is uh, Leva Luzer and Custer? Uh, any of you uh, new to Oakwood will, will get to appreciate this. He was an aviationist as, as well. Uh, here he is in the upper left-hand corner at the, uh, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, anyways, this, uh, John McCready is uh, setting the, the world's altitude record in, in 1921, and that was 34,509 feet. Custer also uh, was a balloonist, and here he is in 1923 in the upper right, and he's taking off from the top of the uh, rival building, and um, he's just promoting Dayton. He had a big banner hanging down that said Dayton, and his ballooning experience prompted him to invent the statoscope, which is an early version of the altimeter. He also invented the Custer chair, and he did that for... Uh, um, patients out at the VA center, uh, some of the old vets out there, and he wanted to uh, have a way for them to get downtown. And then, unfortunately, he, and the first one he did was electric, and they would get downtown and partially have their day and get partially back and have to go down and pick them up and bring them the rest away because the batteries were dead. Couldn't do that today. Today, batteries can get you a range of about 300 miles on, the, on an electric car. And he also invented the Custer car. Uh, eventually, he took those wheelchairs and made them uh, gas powered. And uh, he also invented the Custer car, which uh, we have pictures of here on the right. And you can see these down at the uh, uh, Carillon Park. Our next stop is Georgian and Colonial Revival. And uh, those are uh, popular from 1895 all the way up to now. Uh, the Georgian is larger and often clad in brick. Colonia is a little bit smaller and often in wood. The architects were evoking America's past and patriotism, got a rectilinear form, a symmetrical facade, and this is a what's known as, whoops, sorry. <laughs> there it is. Okay. I'm new with this one. I should have one in. Anyway, this is what is known as a fan light. You can see the fan shape of it. And these are called side lights. And those are usually pretty prominent on, a, on the uh, Georgian colonial revivals. And um, 
It'll also have um, uh, dormer windows on top and tall column porticos and other artistic details. Here are a few more here in Oakwood. So you can get the, this is the original home of uh, uh, John M. Shantz here, which was uh, uh, one of the Shantz children. And that's uh, uh, these also, to me, it's that home I've been in. And it, uh, the attic, again, has an entertainment area up there. Our next stop is Spanish Revival, popular from 1890 to 1935. It's a beautiful home. This one just recently sold and they had it. Uh, we got any real estate people in here? <laughs> but uh, that realtor, that realtor had it listed as a, uh, a Florida bungalow. <laughs> a million dollars with Brookwood tile. Uh, what makes the Spanish revival, a Spanish mission revival is usually a small, bell tower type structure on top. And that's when it becomes a, a mission style. But it's an eclectic mix uh, inspired by the entire history of Spanish architecture, usually clad in stucco, uh, low pitched tile roofs, arched entryways and windows, massive, often curved wooden doors, decorative tiles inside and or outside. Here's a few more. It's a La Bonita up there, so it's uh, the beautiful. Our next stop is Chateau-esque. It was popular from 1880 to about 1910. And it's a French inspiration. It's castle-like with a cut stone facade and classical ornamentation. This is Ravenswood, and it was the home of Isaac Haas. He was an early, early founder here in Oakwood. The stones uh, to build this house originally were from uh, the Virginia Hollinger tennis courts, which at one time was a stone quarry. Um, a lot of people don't know, but uh, Elizabeth Gardens and Howe Stream were uh, gravel pits at one time, and they have been reclaimed in beautiful wooded areas there. So originally it was Second Empire style from the uh, era of uh, Napoleon III, but was transformed to Chateauesque in 1917 by Albert Pretzinger. And at that time they added, you know, they, dang on it, sorry. <laughs> at that time they added this turret, they did an addition on this side and they put this entryway over here. That was the original entryway. Um, and, but when they put the turret on with the staircase leading up, uh, this became the primary entryway. What I do. Okay. <laughs> this is Queen Anne, often referred to as Victoria. Uh, popular from 1880 to 1905. It is some of Oakwood's earliest homes. It usually came with an irregular floor plan and roof shape, differing wall textures, and often with a prominent turret feature. Um, this up here, I was talking earlier about a, a, a sleeping porch and this, from this bedroom, you could access that up there and you could sleep up there uh, on a hot summer night this is before air conditioning. Uh, when I say it has uh, differing wall textures, uh, this one has a combination of clapboard and shingle. Uh, here, uh, this on the National Register of Historic Places in 1980. And this was a two-family home built by uh, Adam Shantz Sr. for family expansion. So when his the children grew up and were leaving home and getting married, they could move into this house. And it's a double. It's a, it, side by side. It has, uh, there's actually two homes there. And um, so that was for family expansion. And once they got established and if they wanted to move out of the neighborhood or away from the, uh, the old man, they, uh, they, they could, got established, they could move on. And here's that home in 1894. Here are several more. Uh, this is the Hauk Honeymoon Cottage. 
And that was built by Eliza P. T. Howe for family expansion as well. We all know what this is. It's my summer cottage in the Hamptons. <laughs> it's neoclassical. It's 1895 to 1950. That's, uh, of course, Hawthorne Hill, the original home of Orville, Catherine, and Bishop Wright. Uh, uh, Wilbur Wright, unfortunately, passed away in 1912 before the home was completed. It's on the National Register of Historic Places, and this was uh, Orville's dog, Sepio, down in the uh, lower right-hand corner. Um, we'll talk about a little bit here, a little more history of the president and the aviator. Uh, uh, as we can see here, uh, F, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt with uh, Orville Wright. Um, in 1920, uh, our governor at the time, James M. Cox, decided he was going to run for president, and he had a running mate in Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Well, he didn't win, but they did uh, campaign together. And in October of 1940, when FDR, who was by now president of the United States, and our entry into this world war in Europe was becoming more and more evident. Uh, he came to Wright Field to check out the readiness of the military field. Also, his son was stationed there. So he picks up James, his old running mate, James M. Cox and Orville Wright, because you gotta, if you're visiting dignitary, you gotta visit our dignitary, which was Orville Wright. And um, they uh, went out to uh, Wright Field. This was the first time that a police department used uh, radios for communications about through the whole thing, through the whole visit. Uh, he was in a 1939 uh, Packard V12. Uh, uh, when he got up towards the corner of uh, Patterson and uh, somewhere up along Patterson Road near Far Hills, um, Orville, who was kind of shy and didn't really want to um, go to this big hoopla. The FDR spoke downtown and they were going to a luncheon together and everything. Orville was always kind of a shy guy anyway. And, and he decided, he got up, shook hands, smiled uh, and thanked him and, and decided he was just going to walk home. <laughs> he was a walker anyway. So as we're saying, we're right here at the corner of Patterson and Far Hills and there's right heading home. <laughs> Um, here's another example of Italian aid. In 1954, um, the original home of Adam Schum Sr. Uh, was transformed into an Italian aid. And here's a few more uh, Italian aids uh, on that slide. This is a 1922 neoclassical apartment building at 635 Far Hills Avenue. Features Corinthian column caps, and you can see the. Uh, uh, you, you're probably all. Some of you may not have ever seen this because you go down Far Hills. You're negotiating a hill, traffic, and uh, and not paying much attention to what's on the side of the road. But that we just uh, actually David Schmidt again did research on it. He got to the Dayton Herald um, on September 20th. We thought that this. House or this apartment building was built in 1927. We uh, David found out found it where it was announced in 1921. Construction was started in 21 with the intention of opening it up in 1922, which they did. And here's a uh, uh, ad from the Dayton Daily News on November 23rd, 1923, and it's featured there with other apartment buildings in, in the Dayton area. Uh, on May 4th of last year, uh, the Oakwood Register did a distinctive homes on that building. And uh, so it's, uh, we nailed down a little more of the history of that structure. What's so amazing about the inside? Right? Say again? What's so amazing about the inside? If you can repeat for Zoom to hear. Okay. Uh, she wants to know what's so amazing about the inside. It's a very well preserved, um, structure. The, the apartment building or the apartments themselves, most of them are two story or two bedroom and they're all in terrific condition. I've been in most of them. 
and they were built for uh, entertaining. So the living rooms and the dining rooms are pretty good size, and um, uh, many of them have what's either called a three seasons room or they are uh, 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 an open balcony. So I live in that building, but I live way down in the basement, a little one bedroom. I call it the cubby hole in the catacombs. So we have a very interesting stuff, uh, air, uh, rare um, picture here. This is a, a uh, inter, what's called international style. It's not Art Deco. Art Deco, if it were Art Deco, that house would look like it's doing 80 miles an hour because of the streamlining and the curves and everything. This is international. And it was introduced between World War I and World War II. While Americans preferred traditional homes, European architects were emphasizing radically new designs without historic precedence. Uh, clean lines prevailed, asymmetrical facade and a flat roof, uh, smooth, unornamented unorn wall surfaces, often in stucco, rare in homes, but most prominent in office buildings. Most renowned international style buildings were the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center and the Stratocash Tower in downtown Dayton. It used to be the old Winters Bank building. It's been several things. Now, this is an experimental home, and it was built in 1936 of steel panels from the Insulated Steel Buildings Company of Middletown, Ohio. Uh, the idea was to make it uh, termite and rock proof, but the idea is abandoned with the onset of World War II when steel production was prioritized toward the wall effort, war effort. Um, there are, I think, four steel homes in Oakwood, all over in Shantz Park. Uh, the one just to the right side of that is a kind of a colonial style, but it is steel. I had a friend of mine who lived there, uh, grew up in there many, many years ago. I was over there one time. He says, he says, this house is made of steel. I said, yeah, what are you talking about? And he's sitting on a couch. He reaches up behind him with his ring, goes, farn, farn. <laughs> you could hear it. It was, it was steel with, with uh, uh, wallpaper on it. Yeah. Did you find anything about people objecting to houses like that, the modern houses being built in Oakland? Uh, occasionally, but... Uh, uh, there's still no, she wants to know if there's been any objections to the more modern style structures being built in Oakwood, but uh, we do have a, a zoning uh, commission and uh, <clears throat> sometimes some people are a little concerned, um, but uh, so, yeah. I know um, I used to live on Woodview way down there mm -hmm. and apparently a prefab was being built behind my street. <laughs> And uh, someone told me that there was um, objections and people parading near the house. On Woodview. She's not on Woodview, but on Acorn. Oh, over on Acorn. Uh, and she was talking about some uh, uh, objections to a, a home that was being built in a more modern style, I guess. Down and, and also panels already. Yeah. And yeah. So, okay. But, you know, the construction values today are different from then. And, uh, these are very solid houses. Uh, uh, some of these houses were built with uh, two by fours that actually measured two inches or by four inches. Are you still with me? Yeah, I just want to make sure you were all still with me. Our next style is going to be prairie style. It was uh, popular from 1900 to 1920. Um, it's indigenous American style attributed to Frank Lloyd Wright, inspired by the vast prairies of uh, Wright's Illinois upbringing. The horizontal aspects are the main feature of the style. So you have open floor plans, a hit roof, wide chimneys. Uh, how, do you, how do you make vertical windows horizontal. Well, you take three of them, put them all together, and you have a, you have a horizontal feature. Uh, they also, this particular house uses a pretty thick clapboard exterior walls, and that's also repeated down here on the vertical porch posts. Vertical porch post here. So that still 
accentuates kind of a horizontal look to it. And uh, often with a belt line, this house has a belt line. It's uh, just a thick piece of uh, wood trim right underneath the windows. Hello. <laughs> you like the kitties? <laughs> Thank you. I'll be here all week. <laughs> Try the deal. But um, there is a belt line right under here. Uh, and, and that kind of just accentuates that horizontal look. Uh, if you want to really see a good example of a Frank Lloyd Wright home, go to Springfield and visit the Westcott house. Mm -hmm. Very beautiful up there. And it's been restored. They spent millions of dollars on it, and they've done an excellent okay. job. Yeah. Uh, this home is up across from, uh, up on uh, West, yeah, West Dixon. Uh, we're not sure. We've heard the architect was Louis Lott, maybe not, but was inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright, but it is not a Frank Lloyd Wright house. We're going to talk about the American bungalow. Uh, it's a type of house to which many architectural styles are applied, most often in craftsman style. It's one to one and a half stories with a broad porch, inspired by the East India bungalow. And uh, Often features built in bookcases, cabinets, and breakfast nooks to maximize interior space usage. Here are uh, several here uh, craftsman style homes from the early uh, 1900s. The one on the right is a rare airplane bungalow, and it is um, and it's so named because it has uh, on the first floor, it has these those wide, um, almost straight. Uh, roof line that resembles wings and then it has a small room up on top and that's reminiscent of a uh, of a cockpit of an old airplane so it's a uh, that's why they named it the airplane bungalows there's one there's two of them here in Oakwood this one's at uh, Schaefer and Aberdeen and the other one is down between Rubicon and Shantz on Far Hills um, Craftsman bungalows are uh, uh, with the uh, color, once again colors from nature. Um, this one is in Kettering, but it's 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 such a, uh, uh, a terrific example of a craftsman bungalow, and uh, the people are really into the style, and they have a, the house is full of craftsman furniture. Yes, sir. What is the word bungalow in architecture? What what is it? It's, yeah, it's it's actually a type of house to which architectural styles are applied. And we'll look at the four square here. It's the so same it's got thing. nothing to do with more like a simple home that I've always heard it applied to very simple. They, yeah, they are kind of simple because like I said, they have um, um, built in uh, bookcases, cabinets and breakfast nooks to uh, maximize interior space usage. So yeah, you are correct on that. I uh, want to talk a little bit here about pattern or catalog homes. These were from the uh, early 20th century. Sears Honor Built were the most well-known, um, but there were quite a few companies that uh, produced them, and more and more are being identified in Oakwood. Uh, this home uh, sits, you go down Telford here, almost to Schaefer, and you'll see, uh, you'll see this home, and there's the ad for it. I think for 1925, and uh, even even based on those prices today, that kit would be 38, you know, 39 thousand dollars. So, still a bargain. <laughs> Here are several more. Uh, this home, this base is Schaefer, but it has a former address. Well, in order when you used to be, you were taxed by the frontage of your home. So the frontage over on uh, Four Boulevard is shorter than on Schaefer Boulevard. So that was a way of getting around taxes. Uh, that's the ad for the Martha Washington. Uh, down here is the Sunbeam. Uh, this particular house, lower left-hand corner, right across the street. Yeah. And here's uh, Blue Ribbon's home. So we uh, did reckon we uh, found this home well, several years ago, but um, 
uh, here is the house, and it's in a, uh, kind of a Spanish revival, and there's the plans for it. The English cottage was 1890s to 1930. Uh, it's a smaller cousin of the full-size English Tudor, and it shares similar charms and details. Um, Joe Desch uh, lived out in one down on uh, uh, Four Boulevard, or I'm sorry, Greenmont Boulevard, and uh, he was uh, uh, he was uh, uh, the engineer down at. Uh, uh, NCR that the government had build this code breaking machine. That's a fascinating story. I'm not going to go into it too much here. The book, The Secret Building 26, is an excellent, and uh, or you can go to DaytonCodeBreakers.org and you get more of that story there. And in the movie, The Imitation Gang uh, came out in 2014, featured the story of Alan Turing who worked in the British version, the original version of the uh, code breaking machine. And he stayed there, uh, I think one or two nights in World War II when he was visiting Dayton. Um, I had a book that uh, had this ad in it. It was a book about old, old homes, old craftsman style homes. And it had uh, uh, this ad in it and it said, uh, house in Chance Platte developed Dayton, Ohio. Uh, attributed uh, to uh, or the architect was Louis Lott of Dayton. It also appeared on some other magazines at the time. And um, we'll talk about magazines here in a few minutes. And uh, I thought, well, where in the heck is that? So I went out and I looked, and there is there is that house. It's over on uh, Orlando Terrace, off in, not too far off of Irving. So uh, it was it's exciting to see this, this stuff and do a little research and find it. Our next home is the Dutch Colonial Revival, and they were popular in 1900 to 1935, and they were popular among the middle class and suburban families. Uh, they were based on an earlier Hudson River area style of the late 18th century. Uh, this is another design that was inspired to reduce taxes. Um, if, you, uh, if your house had a dormer up top or something like that, it really wasn't considered a full two-story house, and that so you were only taxed on a one-story house. Now, how's the best way to get around that? Well, you have this gambrel roof that slopes up here, comes on up, and uh, you have a uh, you take this dormer and you make it so wide it almost comes to the ends of the house. <laughs> but now on this home, it's just a, a, a feature, but back. A couple of hundred years ago, it was a way of getting out of taxes. So, uh, or reducing them anyway. And that's another twist on this one. That's 158 East Dixon. I think it is, yeah. It fronts on Schaefer. Correct. You're looking from the Schaefer view, but it's a house on Dixon Avenue. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, you can't enter it on Dixon Avenue. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I like using this house uh, as an example. If you'll notice, uh, here's a picture from 1916. It was the original home of Ralph G. Rossell, and he was an architect of many of the houses there in Schaefer Heights. Um, I'll have you take note of the, uh, maybe you can't see it very well, but the sh uh, shingles up or the uh, shutters and the light fixtures. We'll go back and you see those are still there. I love the old lights and uh, a lot of times people tear those lights out, throw them away, but there's a big market for them. All you got to do is clean them up, rewire them, and you've got yourself something that would probably be worth more than the entire lighting system that, were, that was, it was replaced by. Here are some more uh, of that same idea, uh, some with the Gambrel roof, some without. This is what's known as a uh, as a four square. And again, the four square, the American four square, again, is the, the big cousin of uh, the American bungalow. So it's two stories instead of one. And it's another one of those types of houses to which many architectural styles are applied, uh, most carbon in the prairie style. Uh, this one is, these two here, probably a little more in a prairie style. Now, the advent of central heating allowed for the square footprint of this 
and other house types. Um, once they got replaced the fire uh, fireplaces with um, furnaces, coal burning furnaces at the time, then they could just build a square house and it heated everything. Uh, from porch alignments, as you uh, get into this, is kind of a typical neighborhood in East Oakwood, and the front porch are alignments within, within a neighborhood. And that's the way you go out in the evenings. Remember, we're talking about magazines. And before TV and radio, you would, in the evening, you go out and sit on your front porch and read magazines, which were very, very popular at the time. And you could sit out on your front porch. You could look up this way. You could see all the porches across the street. You could look down that way, see your neighbors, invite them up for a cup of coffee or a beer. And you could sit there. And back when neighborhoods had neighbors, <laughs> and they still do, they still practice that quite a lot here in Oakwood. And you can make these up to where the front porch is a, a three seasons living space. A lot of people, like I say, still go out there on their front porches in the evening. Oh, this is the Cape Cod. Um, I think we've got one, one or two real estate people here. You know how you look on, it's basically one of the most misrepresented architectural styles in the Montgomery County area, and that's due to the auditor's uh, website. Um, Cape Cods are... Uh, I think I've seen two of them. I've got pictures of both of them here. But uh, it's got the chimney is in the middle because it was central fireplace. It's got a small entryway and there's no gables on top. That's a Cape Cod. Uh, but a lot of, I've even seen Foursquare once described as a, as a, um, as a Cape Cod. But um, this is uh, another Cape Cod. This one's on Schaefer. And these are the only two I've really found in Oakwood that really fit that criteria. And you can tell it's a Cape Cod because their weather vane's got a whale on it. <laughs> they know what it is. <laughs> this is a Williamsburg. It's very similar. Uh, both of the Cape Cod and the Williamsburg, probably from 1925 to 1955. And uh, it, but it has, uh, it's got the chimneys moved to the side. So it's over here. And you got dormers up there to increase the living space upstairs. We'll take a look at mid-century modern, popular from 1940 to 1965. But this is now starting to uh, <clears throat> gain a, a revival in its own. Um, many of these were uh, architecturally designed and they, uh, uh, they were inspired by the prairie style. And... Uh, let me get to, oh, here we go. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, usually one story, open floor plans, uh, glassed in spaces using large windows, contemporary modern details. And as did Frank Lloyd Wright, architects would often design the furnishings to complement the home. Uh, periodicals are uh, the only ones really out there now. I think it's Atomic Ranch Magazine. Uh, that little woods house, we looked at that earlier, and that, as I said, was inspired by a 1940 design. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested, this actually, this was just about three weeks ago, the 20th century Cincinnati sale, and you get a lot of the furniture and uh, um, artistic detail, uh, artifacts and everything. And uh, that uh, uh, is, is making a big comeback right now. This is the ranch style, it was inspired by the prairie style. Uh, housing starts in Oakwood dropped to a trickle during the Great Depression. And uh, after World War II, when housing styles had changed dramatically, these ranch style houses uh, began filling into empty lots. And this is most evident on East Shantz Avenue and uh, the uh, uh, Shantz Park District. And these are in Oakwood, these are all architecturally styled. These are not Huber homes. Uh, many of them, I think. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the transformation. Uh, this is the original Long Romsford homestead in the upper right. And I'll uh, have you pay attention to the this little vent window up here. And here it is down here. Uh, around 1917, it was transformed into a prairie style home. And that is the uh, headquarters of the Oakwood His uh, Historical Society. 
almost said hysterical. <laughs> and that was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1987. So you might want to visit uh, oakwoodhistory.org, take a look at up and coming events. If you're available, uh, these are available online at the Carillon Park gift shop and uh, uh, Secret Building 26, Polonium in the Playhouse, a fascinating uh, read about the uh, Manhattan Project here in Dayton. And uh, do we have any of those for sale? Over here? We have the Polonium, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm acknowledged in that one. <laughs> now these walking tour booklets that I mentioned earlier, these are uh, also their architectural guides as well. So we give you a lot of the details of what we've been talking about here today. And uh, they're available through the Oakwood Historical Society. You can call, you can visit their website, or you can step over to this table over here and they have them available there. Just to give you a little heads up, right at home, as Donna had mentioned earlier, is coming up on April the 23rd. This is usually sells out quick. And I understand when they used to do uh, 500 guests, they're willing it down to 400 and make it a little more manageable. But this, this will probably sell out quick. So if you are interested in that uh, tour, uh, Carillon Park uh, gives the tour of the home itself. And um, then uh, the Oakwood Historical Society gives a tour of the neighborhood and some of Orville Wright's fascinating neighbors. Okay, any other questions? Um, oh my God, yes. <laughs> where did you find, like, what's the best way to research the newspaper listings of homes for sale, newly built homes, all that? Um, you, know, you had from like the 1970s, oh, yeah. 1920s, um, Yeah, uh, I'll let Dave uh, Schmidt answer that. Well, it's been wonderful because uh, historic newspapers have been digitized and the, the text scannable. And so if you have access to that through uh, public libraries, you can get in there and search. So for example, the, 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 uh, the Centerville, Washington library system has a wonderful um resource where you can log into that and also the the, the Dickman public county public library system so the question was uh for our zoomers we had uh we were wondering where to get the information of the vintage uh newspapers they are available through library and, um and and city and county records so. it, it's also important to note different libraries have different collections so just because you go to one doesn't mean it won't be available at another one. And anybody who is an, an Ohio resident, you can get a public library card for any library in Ohio. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Is there a, 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 a guide in general for house style someplace where they are explained? Yeah, you can uh, go online, but again, these uh, walking tour booklets, uh, there are architectural uh, descriptions in there. So they are kind of an architectural guide as well with the details. And other than that, if you're looking for other eras or something, you would probably have to either here in the library or online. Yes, ma'am. The apartment building where you live, are those still rentals or people buy them? They are rented and they don't last long. You slap that, uh, uh, that uh, for rent sign out and sometimes it's down before sunset. So, okay. And sir, I think you were back. Yeah, uh, back in uh, 1980, I uh, bought some furniture from a lady's house over on the uh, other side of Far Hills. It was, if I remember, it was like a gray stucco house. But she had uh, an organ built into the house, the pipes went into the basement, and then down in the basement, she showed me that they had a drying room. It wasn't a, they didn't use dryers, they had this whole room that had racks, and they would just paint the whole room and hang their clothes in these racks. Oh. Have you ever seen that house? Or I, yeah, I, I couldn't tell you. So he had been in a house that had a, what was it, a, a full room of dryer racks for for laundry or yeah yeah uh, it, 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 it was you know before dryers yeah yeah um, but fascinating the whole room was the heat the whole room yeah and hang from your uh phone when you're drying right oh oh awesome and they would heat the whole room and the uh the uh, 
the clothing would, would dry then with the wall hanging there on a the rack. Anybody else? Yes. Is there like a telltale sign that the whole house is built out of a Sears catalog? I'm, I'm sorry, say again. How do you know if your house is built from Sears catalog or something? Uh, oh, uh, like for kid homes? Yeah. There are a lot of books out on Sears homes, and there's another book out, uh, I don't know if it's still in print or not, called Great, Great Houses of the 20s. And uh, I think the historical, I know the Historical Society has one copy because I donated it. But there's uh, several books out on Sears homes and some of the kid homes. Yeah. So one of the one of the keys is it not that you'll see on various parts of the architecture, like in the roof or the uh, the, in the in the basement, you'll see numbers on the wood. Yeah, unfortunately, most of those are on the end and they're up against a wall. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, but there are uh, some of these books on Sears homes has all the ads in them, and you can match your house up to those ads. So. Okay. Well, yes, sir. I just want to ask a question. Um, there aren't very many examples here, but um, in here in Ohio, there seem to be a lot of sort of uh, Two-story houses that are kind of uh, tall and skinny. They look like they look to be architecture that's uh, fairly old. Mm -hmm. And I know one example is between like Hathaway and Schaefer. There's one of the many oldest houses in Dayton. Uh, there's a little house there with a barn in the back. Okay. Um, that, what is that? Is there a name for that style? Uh, yeah, I think, and I forgot to mention this, but uh, the original home of the Oakwood Historical yeah. Society was called a gabled L. And and uh, there's several of these in town. They're very old farmhouses. And um, so that's probably maybe what you're seeing there. Yeah. Okay, well, how are we doing? All right, well, I want to thank everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Some great questions and everything. I'm gonna give you one last thought. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Just as a reminder, we hope to see you next month for the Gardens of Oakland. And next month we'll also announce the fall series. <laughs> Thank you.